attention, I will now turn it over to the presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Briel, and with me is Cecilia Friedman Levin. I'm a judge in the San Francisco Superior Court. I've been a judge for about 17 years, and I currently have a dependency assignment. I am also in charge of all the U visa certification requests for our civil division of our court. Um, Cecilia, do you want to talk about your work a little bit and about ASSISTA? Yes, thank you so much, Judge Briel. Um, my name is Cecilia Friedman Levin, and I am Senior Policy Counsel with ASSISTA. ASSISTA is a small but mighty organization um, that really kind of works at the intersections of domestic violence, sexual assault, survivor advocacy, um, and immigration issues. And we focus our work on immigration reliefs for survivors. And so that is a lot in the context of our self-petitions, U visas, T visas, and we are also a OVW uh, technical assistance provider um, on issues that relate to um, immigration protections for survivors. And I'm delighted um, to be with you all today and um, especially to co-present with Judge Briel. So Cecilia and I really see this as a conversation between ourselves and between all of you. And if you do want to join the conversation with a question, please feel free to put that question in the chat box and we'll try to answer it as, as soon as we can. Our learning objectives for, t for today, um, if we can go to those, are um, to help you um, be better able to understand and explain dynamics of immigration-related abuse. We hope to help you examine how immigration issues can impact judicial proceedings related to domestic violence and sexual assault, including U visa certification processes uh, regarding these case types, and hopefully help you assess how criminal and civil findings can intersect with an immigration matter. So we're going to turn to immigration-related abuse. And I'm going to ask all of you participants to think about what you're seeing in terms of immigration-related abuse in your courtrooms and to think about, as we continue our presentation, why immigrant survivors might be reluctant to call the police. We're going to begin with the power and control wheel. And I know many of you have um, seen the power and control wheel, but this is a little bit of a different version. This is the immigrant power and control wheel. We know that um, domestic violence is a pattern of coercive control, but that Coercive control often looks different when we're talking about immigrant survivors. So there's threats, for example, but there's not just threats to harm, but there are further threats to the immigrant, um, threats to report her to Immigration Customs Enforcement if she calls the police about the abuse. There may be threats to withdraw um, the petition to legalize her immigration status. There are even threats to have her um, non-U.S citizen children removed from the country. So, and as far as children are concerned, there are often um, further threats to take the children um, to another country who are U.S. citizens um, because the citizen abuser can travel freely and she cannot travel if she doesn't have lawful status. There's economic abuse. Uh, threatening to report her if she so-called works under the table, or threatening not to pay uh, the rent or not to pay the phone bill or put food on the table and she's not able to work, and those kind of economic threats if she calls the police. So there's threats not to send any more money back to the home country. You'll see on this diagram what is called the use of citizenship or residency privilege. And there are often threats that if you call the police, they'll believe me, not you, because I'm a US citizen, or I'm the lawful permanent resident. Or there's a threat not to legalize her immigration status or withdraw uh, the papers that were filed on her behalf if she does call the police. There's intimidation, hiding or destroying her passport, hiding evidence of um, a legal marriage, which she might later need to do a VAWA self-petition, 
there is a lot of isolation that we know normally goes on in domestic violence situations, but there's isolation even further in not letting her learn English, not letting her speak to her family in the home country, um, not letting her associate with people who came to the, the United States from her own community. And certainly there's a lot of emotional abuse, even lying to her about her immigration status. Um, Cecilia, any thoughts about this? Anything you'd like to add? No, and I think, um, you know, we're talking about using citizenship or residency privilege. I think that also comes with language access. And I think that's kind of another part of that, where we're talking about, well, if the abuser can speak English better than the survivor, then they would be better, better able to explain to a service provider, to a law enforcement agency, and kind of manipulate the story that way. And so Absolutely. I think the only thing that I would add to what you said, Judge Briel, is exactly what you said at the outset. It's Because when we're looking at domestic violence or intimate partner violence, it is about that coercive control. And that is the manifestation of the physical abuse and emotional abuse. And so this immigration-related abuse is part and parcel of the maintenance of that power, the maintenance of that control. Yes. And these um, are really abuser-generated obstacles that are put in front of the survivor. So let's turn to our hypothetical and um, be mindful of those dynamics we just went over as we go through our hypothetical. We have Talia, who's from El Salvador, and she comes to the United States without documentation in 2010. In 2012, she meets Simon, who is a United States citizen. They fall in love, they marry, they have a daughter, Sarah. And Simon promises that he will file papers for Talia to become a United States citizen. Simon becomes physically abusive. He tells her that if she calls the police, he's going to withdraw the papers that he plans to file and that she will be arrested because she's undocumented. He tells her she will never see Sarah again. After one incident, when he cuts her arm with a scissors in front of the children, Talia leaves with both her children to her friend Sophia's house. And Sophia takes pictures of the injury and urges Talia to call the police. But Talia is very reluctant to do so. So turning to our next slide, what we um, are going to see are barriers to accessing services. We, we we all, have, can we ask our yeah. participants a few questions before we go on? And maybe Absolutely. we can have them put their answers in the chat box? Absolutely. OK. Um, so what, do, what does everyone see? And please just write it in the chat box. What do folks notice as kind of immigration-related abuse? If we go back to that kind of power and control wheel, what are some examples of what that kind of looks like in our hypo? Right, so Melissa says the withdrawal of the papers, starting to do that. Intimidation, withdrawal of the calling the police. Right. She never sees Sarah again, and so we have that kind of um, kind of the use of the children. Right. Great. So a Thank lot you. of uh, participants see those kind of um, coercive control dynamics that um, we had just seen in the power and control wheel playing out in the hypothetical. Um, and, and someone said not familiar with the United States process. And um, that's a very important point, which does lead to our next slide, because there are barriers to accessing services. There are institutional obstacles um, to accessing justice, such as not understanding um, how the processes work within the United States. There are barriers certainly language barriers. Um, Talia does not speak English or Eng does not speak it well. And she may have past experiences in her home country that were negative. 
maybe the Guatemalan government was um, was abusive in its own way, and she thinks the same will be um, for the same situation will happen in the United States with the government she needs to interact with. She has a, a, a fear of being uh, removed by immigration and customs customs enforcement, and she certainly has practical concerns. Where is she going to live? How is she going to support her two children? How is she going to pay the bills? And she is afraid that um, she may be separated from Sarah, who is a United States citizen. Um, so she isn't familiar with the United States um, court processes. Vasilia, any thoughts? Right, and I just want to point to something that you said when we were talking about that power and control wheel um, in terms of abuser-generated risks or abuser-generated barriers. And if you all are not familiar with it already, I recommend highly a book by Jill Davies called Domestic Violence Advocacy. And in that book, she basically lays out certain categories of barriers and of risks, um, what she calls life-generated risks and abuser-generated risks, um, and consequences for reaching out for help. And in that kind of life-generated or systemic risk, those are things like a poverty, where a person lives, if someone is in an urban center or a rural location, the availability of service providers to help them. Um, it also is kind of the experiences of discrimination within these institutions. Um, and the other part we're talking about, abuser-generated risks, and that I think is along the lines of what G Judge Brielle was describing, the, the physical abuse, um, child abuse, controlling resources, and manipulation of the legal system. And so I think both of these categories exist independently, but oftentimes we, I think that abusers can also manipulate those life-generated risks, those systemic risks, to further maintain that coercive control. And so I think that is something I just wanted to bring to mind in when we're talking about this topic in particular is the ability of that crossover of the nexus between kind of the systemic barriers and also the uh, abuser-generated barriers. Great. So they're, they're very related. Right. Um, so I think um, on the next slide, um, I think that point that we want to drive here is that these risks are not just ap academic, right? It, it, these risks do not exist in the abstract. It's a demonstrable kind of chilling effect of survivors reaching out for help and documented cases where these threats of immigration-related abuse have made uh, national headlines. Um, that first one about the Texas deputy um, threatening to deport the mother of a four-year-old victim. And so we wanted to kind of make sure, pull that from kind of this theoretical framework down to the reality of what people are facing. And so, um, you know, to that extent, I think that there was um, a survey that was released last spring for over 700 service providers nationwide in 46 states. Um, and that survey did find that 78% of advocates reported that immigrant survivors did express concern about contacting the police. And that three in four service providers responding to the survey rep uh, reported that uh, survivors had concerns about going to court, um, which directly affects all of our work. And that 43% of advocates who work with immigrant survivors drop civil or criminal cases because they were fearful to continue with their cases. So is this so, the survey put out by the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges and NIWA? Oh, so that is a, an additional one. I can find those results. Um, but this is the one okay. that is put forth for the National Network to End Domestic Violence. But you're right that NIWA, which is the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, also did a survey of not only service providers, but in that context of judges and also um, prosecutors and law enforcement officials who did kind of report that it was harder to investigate domestic violence cases uh, for immigrant survivors and that 
advocacy organizations report that fewer cases for these survivor-based protections, like vow with self-petitions, U visas, and T visas, um, that fewer people were um, seeking these protections. And so I can find all those details, and maybe I can put those, if it's OK, um, in the chat box um, or out later as a resource. But yes, that was another survey. Thank you for great kind of, with a with kind of a more of a wraparound, not just advocate focused. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about now um, about just how complicated this can be. <laughs> and so um, there's another organization um, called the Full Frame Initiative, uh, which I recommend you looking into when you have a moment. And their work really focuses on how survivors, like all, like everyone, you know, have different roles in their lives, and they face multiple complex issues, right? Not solely the violence that they are experiencing. And so the work of this initiative reminds me of about the work um, that we do and how we, because of the mission and the recourses of our own institutions, really focus on one part of the puzzle. Right? This is my work. This is what I do. Um, but I think it is good to be reminded, especially in this context, that survivors may be working at the intersections of a lot of different systems that affect their immigration matter whether they are seeking a protection order or whether or not they are a respondent in a civil protection order proceeding, uh, whether or not they are seeking custody or divorce, whether they are the victim witness or whether or not they are a defendant in a criminal matter, and also kind of the scope of federal immigration policy and law and how that policy and law is being implemented at the state and local level. And that is just, that's not just the local immigration office, right? That is also kind of state ordinances or local ordinances and everything else that might be going around, um, around uh, that might relate to immigration policy. And so in the, con in the framework of the legal work that we do, um, just wanted to highlight um, that there's a lot of moving pieces to this puzzle. And while all work, our work, you know, understandably, only kind of focuses on one piece of this, it is important that we are connecting to other advocates, other people in our community who have some insights into all of these other different other pieces. And if that is a state's attorney's office or a public defender, who else might be able to, we need to kind of make sure that our networks include individuals who can speak to these different parts of the puzzle. Um, to improve our outcomes for survivors. I think that's so true for judges also, because judges only usually see a small piece of what's going on with the party before them. But if a judge has a civil matter, whether it's a dependency matter or a family matter, um, chances are that that party is also um, showing up in criminal court because there's a criminal matter taking place. And it's important for judges also to connect with other judges in these other arenas and to be mindful of the fact that this person is going through all these different systems. Exactly. And that have implications for one's immigration matter. Uh, for example, a VAWA self-petitioner can apply for a VAWA benefit up to two years of the divorce between her and her abuser. Right? So that is one way where kind of the family law is connected to um, an immigration. Um, similarly, we're going to talk a little bit about further on kind of criminal matters and one's um, participation in the investigation or prosecution um, obviously relates to additional protections in the U visa context. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I think you know, both from the judicial perspective and also from the advocate's perspective, um, there may be a lot to go on going on at the same time. And on this next slide uh, is a to show us the agencies, at least at the federal level, who have a role to play in immigration policy. Because this is a really confusing topic. <laughs> I think it's, I've heard that immigration is the most complex after tax law, but now I think it might actually be pushing for the most complicated. 
And so here's just a list of kind of the federal agencies and the work that they do around immigration policy. At the Department of Health and Human Services, we have the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And this is the division of HHS, which talks about the benefits and service programs to refugees and to asylees and to certain other uh, groups of immigrants, like Cuban and Haitian entrants. And they also provide placement um, to unaccompanied children who are entering the United States and provide them with shelter until they can kind of be connected to an adult guardian or parent. Um, and or who are other kinds connected to sponsors in the United States. And so they are in charge of making the placement decisions for unaccompanied kids, you kind of oversee the policy and infrastructure of those different issues. Um, and then we have at the Department of Justice, we have the Executive Office for Immigration Review. Um, which we pronounce as um, EOIR or ER, which I think is kind of, um, so it's pronounced by this acronym, EOIR, the Executive Office for Immigration Review. And that is a division that uh, has all of the immigration courts nationwide and also contains the appellate body of the immigration courts, which is the Board of Immigration Appeals. And then within the Department of Homeland Security, this is really where we are used to seeing immigration policy play out. You have the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, and this is the agency that is responsible for adjudicating affirmative applications for immigration benefits. So if you're applying for a VAWA self-petition, you're applying for a U visa, you're applying for a family member to come in with immigration benefits, or your application for legal permanent residency, you would file affirmatively with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service. Um, and then we have the enforcement branches of Immigration and Customs Enforcement and the Customs and Border Patrol. And other divisions within the DHS that I think is just important to mention uh, is the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties um, that does investigations of these different components for civil rights violations. And also DHS maintains the CIS Ombudsman's Office in which it would help different stakeholders or people who are applying for benefits to be able to do liaison work in order to fix case problems. And then at the Department of State, you have consular affairs. So those are the officials who are doing the in-country interviews for people who are wishing to enter the United States. You have the Trafficking in Persons Office, which focuses its work on, on human trafficking both doing uh, reporting work and also um, work within kind of with the destination and, and source countries and, and deals with trafficking issues internationally. And then there's the Population and Refugee and Migration Division, which does kind of the refugee work abroad. So I think when we're talking about immigration, this is just to lay out the different people who are involved in that process, um, kind of at least at the federal level. So to me, this is very confusing as a judge. And okay. for me, <laughs> and most of my colleagues mm -hmm. in courts, um, we became judges, but before that we weren't immigration lawyers or immigration experts. And I would just imagine if this is confusing to me, this must be, you know, quadruply confusing to immigrant survivors who have to wade through all these systems and bureaucracies. What do you think? Yes, and I think that's particularly true in immigration court um, because you're in a position where a person who is a respondent and on the opposite side of you is an ICE trial attorney, but you're arguing before another executive branch, DOJ. And so I think, you know, just figuring out how this all plays together is extremely complex because you're making a case for one government agency and then as an opposing party, you have another one. And so I think it, it can be very confusing um, to kind of understand the different pieces and people who might be involved. Well, so keeping in mind um, these different agencies and entities and um, and the power and control wheel we've gone over, let's go on and, and take a look at our hypo a little further. <laughs> 
Talia tries to go to a local domestic violence shelter. The shelter staff are concerned they will get in trouble for harboring an undocumented immigrant, and they have no plan for providing interpretation for her. Um, with that in mind, we are going to do some polling questions. So um, I'm going to ask our participants to get ready. I'm going to read these questions. They're true or false questions. And then all of you can weigh in with true or false. And Cecilia is going to give us the right answer. So the first <laughs> one, survivors who are undocumented do not have access to emergency shelter and housing assistance. True or false? So. All right. We have that ninety-six percent saying yes. So what's the right answer, Cecilia? Okay. So okay, we have ninety-two percent saying false, and we have a six percent saying that is true. Um, and that is false. Um, survivors who are undocumented do have access to emergency shelter and housing um, assistance. And what we can do is we'll do all these polls at once, and then I'll explain them one by one. Okay. So the second one, survivors who are undocumented have access to medical and public health services necessary for life or safety. Okay. Okay. So then and our last poll, one. Oh, and this poll we have a about yeah, eighty-five percent saying that is true. Um, that undocumented survivors have access to medical and public health service necessary for life and safety. Um, and eighty-five percent of you, that is true. And so we'll end this poll and go to the next. All right. So the third one: meaningful access to language access is required by federal grant recipients. True or false? Okay, and so the 93% of you that says true, you are correct. Well done. We have a very um, well-educated so group here. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about the concerns of the shelter staff. Um, if you can go back a slide. So here we have um, concerns about service providers. And if anyone wants to raise their virtual hand, kind of in that upper left-hand corner, how many of us have heard this as a concern in their area? If anyone has concerned, heard this concern about service providers for language access or, um, or otherwise kind of concerns about helping individual uh, undocumented survivors? OK, so a few of you. And so um, there is an a resource by the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence, uh, which I recommend talking to, which specifically addresses this issue. And I want to talk about what this means, um, about this concern. And so the law that prohibits harboring would require a prosecutor to prove that a program knew or recklessly disregarded the a fact that people were undocumented and encouraged or in the illegal entry or concealed, harbored, shield a client from detection by immigration authorities. And so the cases that have been um, prosecuted, you know, is usually kind of for-profit for assistance that violates the federal har harboring law, um, which it means that helping someone cross the border illegally um, to try to transport someone with the purpose of evading immigration laws. And so this, there's never been a case, to my mind, in which a service provider has been implicated in the least, if 
especially where one is providing legal services or also some kind of services, emergency services. And so I think that this is something that I recommend this Asian Pacific Institute for Gender-Based Violence Advisory on. But there's also, as federal grantees, you might have non-discrimination obligations um, under the Civil Rights Act, under your own grant provisions, like FIPSA, for example, includes no restrictions on serving immigrants. And so I think it's really important to remember you might have obligations as if you do receive these federal fundings, it prohibits discrimination in any program or activity that requires finance, uh, federal financial assistance. And that does include meaningful access to uh, language access um, uh, for low English proficiency individuals. There was a survey done I believe it was in 2013 um, by Casa de Esperanza. And basically what they said is that um, several women reported being denied critical services like housing or food assistance, medical help, um, that because they didn't have proper identification or proper language access. And so I think it's really important what we and they on themselves, Casa de Esperanza and Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence, have language access toolkits for service providers to help them implement this language access plan. And so I wanted to kind of talk about how it's required to provide meaningful access for low English proficiency survivors um, and that you do have service providers that they receive federal funding have non-discrimination provisions that would come into play. Um, also, I think it's important that in 2016, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Justice, and Department of Health and Human Services, and this I think is in your resource list, um, issued a joint letter to address the problem of inconsistent and desperate treatment of immigrant survivors. And this letter reminds agencies that there are certain services that are available to everyone uh, regardless of immigration status, if the services are necessary to protect life and safety. And so I think that's what we're talking about in that, and that includes short-term shelter for homelessness and for victims of domestic violence. It includes community food banks and soup kitchens, crisis, crisis counseling and intervention programs, um, and medical and public health services necessary to protect life and safety. And so this is um, a little bit of an overview in this slide of what we're talking about, about the obligations for non-discrimination and what that means and how it's been interpreted for services necessary for the protection of life and safety. Um, I also want to say the judges see the concern about harboring undocumented immigrants play out in delinquency and in dependency court with um, undocumented children. I have seen concerns of social workers and probation officers saying, well, we will be harboring an undocumented child if we transport them to an out-of-home placement or if we transport this child to um, an out-of-state placement of foster care. And I think that um, what you said, Cecilia, about um, non-discrimination obligations is really important to keep in mind when these arguments come before a judge about um, various system players saying they can't harbor undocumented immigrants. That's a great point. And we did talk about um, language access and some tools for um, advocates. Again, that's Casa de Esperanza has a language access toolkit for agencies who do not have a language access plan. Um, as does the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. Um, Judge Brielle, what does um, language access look like in, in your court, and how is that important for survivors? Well, we're lucky because we have really good interpreters that are certified mm -hmm. interpreters. Um, but sometimes some um, courts get interpreters that really are not great interpreters. So even though an interpreter, I mean, you're lucky in some states in their courts that they get an interpreter at all, but if it's not really a, 
a good interpretation. I'm wondering if um, there is meaningful access. Um, so, you know, there's all different types of interpretation. I once had a situation with a, um, a Contra interpreter and a Sandinista victim. And so obviously there was an interpretation, but there was friction. And so how much was being interpreted, interpreted and how, um, you know, there was a little concern about whether it was meaningful interpretation. But um, I'm fortunate that in my court we have excellent interpreters, and we seem to have very important standards in California, but I'm also mindful of the fact that not all states have meaningful access um, in terms of language. Okay. Shall so we um, we're now going to talk about immigration issues in the courtroom and how these issues impact judicial proceedings, and we're going to move to our hypo with Talia. Talia is worried about going to get a, pr a protection order. She, she's going to get one, but she's afraid to go to court because she doesn't know if ICE will be in her courtroom. And I'm wondering if um, ICE is coming to the courtrooms of our participants um, on this webinar. I'm wondering how many participants see this happening in their courts. If you um, can type in the chat box, it would be really um, valuable to know. So some aren't seeing ice show up so far. OK. So that's good to know. Um, and as Cecilia said, um, NIWAP, National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, um, spearheaded by Leslie Orloff and the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, did a survey um, recently this year that showed that um, just the fear of ICE coming to the courtroom um, caused a lot less people to, to, a lot less immigrants to seek protective orders or to seek U visa certifications or to even call 911. Right, and I think if, um, looking at the results of the survey now that 54% of judges who participated in the survey reported that court cases were interrupted due to an immigrant crime survivor's fear of coming to court. And so I think that is kind of the, the other side of the question, right, in terms of if ICE is showing up, but have you heard from survivors, and you could raise your virtual hand, um, that there's concern about it. That you have. Okay, so a few of you. Well, looking at um, courthouse enforcement, going to our next slide. Um, right. There are different um, courthouse enforcement um, policies. ICE has a policy, and they try to do as I understand it, Cecilia, targeted enforcement. So um, right. they try not to enforce um, detainers of individuals seeking protection of the court in terms of restraining orders or stay away orders, um, that they have to certify that they're not relying on abusers for information to go and um, pick up someone who's at, on the courthouse steps. Um, the state certainly, different, different states have different responses. Chief justices or chief judges are taking a stand and talking about the impact of ICE on courthouse steps and um, making statements about how troubling this is for survivors to then access justice in our courtrooms. And courts are beginning to have policies and public awareness campaigns um, to encourage people to access justice and, and know they have a right to come to court and access justice. There are survivor protections under the Violence Against Women's Act um, on domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and trafficking cases. And um, enforcement is not to be taken on these cases. Is that correct, Cecilia? Um, uh, 
ish. So <laughs> we can uh, we we can uh, I think I'll try to to flesh out some of the things that we we talked about um, in terms of the ICE policy on courthouse enforcement. Uh, they released a policy in January of 2018, and I think this is in your resource list. Um, and it developed this kind of written policy, and the rationale for not including courthouses as sensitive locations, um, like, for example, schools or hospitals um, or faith organizations, courthouses are exempt from that. And the rationale is because they say that individuals who are entering courthouses have been screened and that it is, you know, reduces the safety risk for everybody in conducting enforcement actions discreetly in court proceedings. Um, as Judge Briel mentioned, their policy is to do targeted enforcement against specific individuals, um, against individuals who um, maybe have an old order of remover, removal but have failed to depart, um, or they're not supposed to have any other collateral uh, enforcement targets. Uh, for example, family members or friends accompanying someone to court um, absent kind of special circumstances. And I think, as Judge Briel mentioned, the state response to this is going to depend on the state. And I think that's where we had our Venn diagram of all these different arenas. That's another place where this comes into play, right? Because the court has to review what the state laws are or city or county ordinances if they have specific policies about these statements or litigation. Or, you know, some states might limit actions in response to immigration and customs enforcement, while others might engage in programs like 287G, where there is kind of increased cooperation. And so I think that's where kind of the state response is going to differ, but it's important to understand what all these different circles are um, and how that might affect access and also whether courts have their own written policies on access and whether or not that needs to be kind of looked at um, given the ICE policy from this year. But I think that for survivor protections, um, there is protections with regard to enforcement actions. And I want to talk a little bit about them here. This is where so it gets a little talk about, It sounds like sure. I was a little bit incorrect because it sounds like um, ICE can still come to the courthouse and they can still make arrests of people. Um, they're just targeted. They're supposed to be targeted, yes. And um, so I think that there was a case recently in North Carolina where a survivor was arrested because she was a defendant in a criminal matter. Um, and, you know, I think that's also kind of we're talking about manipulations of systems. Right, and so thinking about, we're going to talk about this, I think, further on in our discussion, um, and not in, in kind of making sure that, um, you know, this might be another area where survivors are, are kind of impacted by these policies. Great. It's confusing. It's a little, but that's why we're here, right? This is why we're here. This is why ASSISTA exists, is to provide technical assistance and additional information on these questions as they arise in your own practice, in your own work. Um, we're here to try to you kind of navigate all of this. Um, and part of this are certain kind of protections that are codified and it's actually passed by Congress um, in VAWA 2005 that talk about protection about information. And I think it's important to talk about this in connected to um, issues of, in the courthouse because of these location prohibitions and what this means. So we have 8 U.S.C. 1367. And this was passed in VAWA 2005 to protect information for survivors. And Congress created these statutory protections because they wanted to make sure, and I'm quoting from the Congressional um, 
record here, designed to ensure that abusers and criminals cannot use the immigration systems against their victims. So these protections are created with that specific purpose to combat the, to combat the manipulation of these systems against survivors. And so it has three different parts. The first one is that there is protection about information with cases that have been filed. So that if I file a VAWA self-petition or a U visa or a T visa, right, that that information cannot be disclosed to a third party, you know, absent cer certain um, uh, exceptions that are enumerated in the law, like for subpoenas or public safety issues. Um, and so this is something that is important, that if something has been filed, then that information should not be disclosed to an abuser, a member of the abuser's household, um, or anyone in their family, right? And then the second part of this is reliance on abuser-provided information. And that says, that DHS, DOJ, Department of State, or any of their components cannot make an adverse decision in a case based solely provided um, by information solely provided by an abuser or a member of their household or family. So they cannot make a negative decision in the case based only on the word of the abuser or the member of their family. And so that is really important because that applies to anyone with a pending or approved file self-petition or U visa or a T visa, um, but also someone who might be in the process of applying. And so I think that's also something to know that they cannot rely solely based on, on information provided by an abuser. They can independently verify information provided by an abuser, but they cannot rely on it solely. Um, and making an adverse decision in that case. Now, I want to talk about the location prohibition. And the location prohibition basically say they apply at these places, at shelters, rape crisis centers, supervised visitation centers, family justice centers, or courthouse in connection with a protection order, child custody, civil or criminal case, involving to or related to domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, or stalking. It says that enforcement actions are not to be taken at this location unless ICE can certify in writing that it complied with these first two protections, that it didn't rely on information solely provided by the abuser in, in conducting that enforcement action, and that it makes sure that information wasn't disclosed about a protected case. So they conduct locations at these locations, but they must certify in writing that it complied with this law. So it's not that they can't, but it's an extra layer of protection to make sure that they did not rely on information provided by an abuser to conduct that enforcement action. So are there violations that occur of 8 U.S.C. 1367 protections? There, yes. And so the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, if we go back to our lovely chart um, here, this Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at DHS is an investigative body if people believe that there is a violation of this law. If there is not that certification that it complied with the protections, and this would be the body at DHS that would be involved in making those uh, determinations if it's a violation. There is also a $5,000 penalty or disciplinary action for each violation. It is unclear to me if that's a private right of action. I am not certain it is, um, but I haven't seen that actually be awarded to anybody. So if you have, I'd love to see it. Um, but there is. Um, a civil penalty, a $5,000 fine or disciplinary action for violations of these protections. So if I understand you correctly, Cecilia, if ICE complies with these protections and they have information, they can still um, go to battered women's shelters or family justice centers or, or the courthouse. 
that they have to comply with these protections, right? Because I think the certification requirement, according to ICE's own guidance, you know, reflects the congressional intent that ICE tr tread lightly at these locations, right? Because otherwise, that um, kind of runs counter to the protections that we um, that were created for their protection, right? And so I think that this, coupled with some ICE guidance from 2011 on prosecutorial discretion for victims and witnesses, um, is is guidance to ICE um, about um, about enforcement actions and about its treatment of victims and witnesses. Um, so it doesn't mean they can't, um, but I think it was designed to be put in place that they um, that they be mindful about conducting uh, enforcement actions at these locations. So we have an interesting question by Yesenia. Um, is that one you think we should answer now, or we'll get to answer it further in our hypothetical, Cecilia? I think we might. So, but I like the foreshadowing. Thank you, Yasmina, for your question. <laughs> the questions about um, um, if, if someone um, can ask questions about uh, VAWA was applied for or um, whether AUSC 1367 prohibits private parties from making inquiries about VAWA applications. And we will talk about that, but it's an excellent question. Right. It is an excellent question, but it talks about the prohibition um, at 8 U.S.C. 1367, right, is on DOJ, um, Department of State, Department of Homeland Security. So I think it kind of also bears thinking about who the prohibition is on. And so we can talk more about that in the context of our hypo. So moving on then to our hypo, Talia applies for a civil protective order, but she's afraid Simon will bring up the fact She's undocumented, and she um, and and it goes back to our um, power and control wheel that we um, showed. No one will believe you because you're undocumented. Um, and Simon files a cross petition against Talia and seeks custody of Sarah. He alleges that it's not in Sarah's best interest for Talia to get custody because she's undocumented, so she wouldn't be allowed to work legally to support Sarah. And Simon also um, alleges that Talia will take Sarah back to her home country, that Sarah is a flight risk. And um, I have any of you come across this in your own um, cases? Talia is a flight risk, and uh, she can't support Sarah. She's undocumented. So I see that people are, t are typing. And um, the comments are that um, this happens consistently with most cases um, that have uh, similar fact patterns involving undocumented immigrants. So turning to our um, next slide, so this is a comment. This is common, I think, both these allegations of flight risk are common in both criminal and civil cases um, that many of my colleagues have seen in their courtrooms. But going to um, our next slide, the um, fear of losing children is one of the top reasons that immigrant survivors of violence stay with their abusive partners. The National Institute of Justice has done a number of studies that say the number one fear of battered immigrant women is fear of being removed, fear of deportation, or as it's now called, removal. But really what goes hand in hand with, with that fear is the fear of being separated from their children and the fear of losing their children. And survivors really do believe that the abuser will get custody because of the immigration, because of the 
lawful immigration status of the abuser, that the abuser somehow has a leg up um, and the survivor has a real lack of knowledge about the laws in the United States. Um, in California, there is Senate Bill 1064, which is called the California Reuniting Immigrant Families Act that prohibits exclusion of custody um, based on immigration status. And many states are now um, enacting similar statutes. But survivors really are afraid of our laws here and about um, their ability to um, gain custody of their children because of their lack of uh, lawful status. Um, going to our next slide. Immigration status. Um, the abuser is often going to try to raise the survivor's immigration status in an effort to try to gain advantage in temporary custody and support issues. Um, and it's really should be a red flag to us judges for as part of um, further abuse, um, emotional abuse that's continuing to be perpetrated in our very courtrooms. So think about those power and control dynamics. Um, it is a pattern of abuse. And the abuser certainly can say that the survivor is a flight risk due to her lack of status. But really, I think that judges need to view that claim the way um, anyone claims flight risk, whether they're an immigrant or a non-immigrant. And we have to look at ties to the community, um, length of time in the community. We have Talia here who was um, here from 2012 to 2018. So she has ties by now to the community. And she has um, children who are probably in school in the community. They may speak English better than they speak Spanish. Um, but so, so the claim of, and we're going to talk about it a little further in another slide, the claim of flight risk is um, often um, an unsubstantiated claim. There's um, the fact that there's no way to work because uh, she does not have work authorization is often going to be seen in custody disputes. And, um, and this is not necessarily true either if um, there are findings of fact that domestic violence has taken place so that the survivor has um, legal remedies and options under the Violence Against Women Act that can lead to work authorization and permanency. Um, but victims are often undocumented because their status has been dependent on the abuser's immigration status. But interestingly, in this case, Simon never filed um, for Talia to become a citizen, even though they've been married from 2012 to 2018. Um, any thoughts on this, Cecilia? Well, oops. hearing no thoughts, we're going to move on to our next slide. Let's see. Let me get to that. So um, among abusive spouses who could have filed legal immigration papers for an immigrant survivor, there's a study that was done by uh, Leslie Orloff that showed, and this was a study I think done in 2006 that showed that 72.3% never actually filed immigration papers. So, um, and you know, these statistics sort of break down the last slide that we talked about. And um, almost 30% who did file, there was a delay in filing for close to four years. So really, um, Filing often never happens in these particular cases of um, immigrant abuse. Let's see. As to the flight risk allegation, um, 
court should treat these allegations that Talia's going to take the child, there's going to be child abduction, um, that she's a flight risk. Um, they should look at these cases like any other cases um, of child abduction, whether it's an immigrant or a non-immigrant. Um, there needs to be evidence for these allegations that uh, maybe Talia has a, a, a um, ticket to fly back to her home country, but really we do need to look at her connection to the United States. Does she have plans to, to leave? Um, is her removal from the country imminent? Um, does she um, pay rent herself on the, apart on the apartment? Um, are her children U.S. citizens? How long has she been in the community? Um, so these are all things to look at. I think a really important case in this arena is the Lopez Valenzuela versus Arpaio case. It is a federal case, but really the language in this case is strong and dispels myths that immigrants are necessarily flight risks. Um, it's a case that is really um, valuable in both criminal, in the criminal arena as well as the civil arena. And what this case says, and I'm quoting from the case, is there is no evidence that undocumented status correlates closely with unmanageable flight risk. And that is a, a, a very strong statement. Um, and in that case, and the, the quote goes on to say, the defendant speculates that undocumented undocumented residents pose a greater flight risk than lawful residents because they supposedly lack strong ties to the community um, and have quote unquote home in another country to which they can flee. It took probably a lot for Talia in our hypothetical to get to the United States um, and to make her home here for six years. So that's a very important case. It also goes on to say that many undocumented immigrants were brought here as young children and have no contacts or roots in the other country, and um, that nearly 50% of undocumented immigrants have been in the country for more than 10 years. And our hypo, again, Talia has been here for about six years. So this case is extremely important when judges are hearing allegations about flight risk or, or child being taken back to the home country. Cecilia? I think that, um, what are your thoughts about countering these allegations? We, she has lost audio. Oh, thank you. I'm here. Oh, there she Hello. goes. I'm back. <laughs> oh, so yeah. glad you're back. So yeah. um, talk to us a bit about countering these allegations um, about flight risk. And, um, no, and to your point that you made um, earlier, and I think that, again, to our earlier point about the complexity of the of the system is having someone who can come in to try to explain the process I think is very important. A lack of immigration status um, doesn't mean that you are going to be sent back to your country right away. Um, you know, it possibly I think that's so, such an important point. I mm -hmm. love expert testimony. And most judges like me aren't immigration experts. So expert testimony on likelihood of uh, deportation or removal is um, outstanding in, in my court. Right, because again, all of this is case by case. You know, so where if someone, for example, has an expedited removal order, then that is a process that can be very, very quick. And so I think that that is different from someone who entered in uh, without documentation you know, 15 years ago and has no incident or trouble since then. And so I think getting a sense of what this means for this particular individual and having that kind of testimony or education um, is a really important part of that. And also that there are 
um, benefits which created by Congress to provide protection for survivors. And if we're thinking about something, for example, you know, U visas was created with the dual purpose of being a tool to investigate or prosecute crimes and prote provide protection for individuals who are coming forward to report those crimes. And so looking in kind of the congressional intent in establishing these protections is exactly for individuals uh, who are experiencing domestic violence, sexual assault, in order for them to engage with the system and also have um, protection from deportation. Again, because having that protection against deportation kind of takes the tool away from abusers and perpetrators of crime to be able to manipulate, that they are able to come forward without that fear of abuser retaliation. Great. So let's look at our hypo again. And in our hypo, Talia now files a complaint for divorce and custody of Sarah based on the domestic violence. Simon's answer alleges that Talia just married him because he's a citizen, although no paperwork for status was filed. So he fits in that 70% category of spouses who could have filed for Talia to become a citizen, but just never did. Um, remember, they were married in 2012, and uh, this is now 2018, um, so it's doubtful that she, that Talia would have any lingering hope that he's going to file papers, and he's been extremely abusive. Um, so when I read this hypo as a judge, I, I, these red flags are already popping up, um, and, and he's uh, talking about his citizenship privilege. He just married him because he's a citizen. And, and he's saying somehow that's related to, um, to her um, and that she shouldn't get custody of Sarah. So, um, so is this where I get to interview you, Judge Biel? Yes. <laughs> All right, wonderful. And so I think, and also um, other um, judges and judicial officials who are on the webinar, I would, would love your input as well. Um, but this and is so would I. <laughs> this is where I get to play talk show host for a moment. Um, so if Talia was in your courtroom, Judge Briel, how would you approach this? Um, if you heard Simon's, um, came, if you read Simon's answer uh, alleging that they just married because he was a citizen? Well, I think um, I, I would, first of all, um, want to assure Talia, as well as Simon, that everyone in my courtroom gets due process regardless of their immigration status. I would want her to know that up front, and I would want him to know that, that you don't have a leg up in court because you are a citizen. That everyone in uh, my, well, this court, I would say, has a right to be heard, and that everyone's testimony is equal. And um, I would also, want to explain to the parties um, um, about the Re Reuniting Immigrant Families Act that we have in California that prevent um, my consideration of child custody based on immigration status. And, you know, looking, are, are you going to ask me the rest of these questions? Sure, because, yes. <laughs> well, if, because if you're asking me to what degree is it relevant to the best interest of the child, mm -hmm. um, honestly, I, I really believe, and I would probably say in court, that it's much better to have a nurturing, caring, non-citizen parent than a citizen parent ab abuser. And it's really, this case is going to be very important on the findings of fact that I make. But when I look at the photos that I'm sure Talia will present to me of the injury she received when Simon stabbed her in the arm with the, uh, the scissors um, in front of her children, that I would make findings of fact about the domestic violence. And so I would rather have... Um, I would think it would, it would be in the children's best interest to have the nurturing, caring, non-citizen parent to be the parent, the parent who gets custody. 
um, you know, I would be very skeptical, I think, about the negative information that Simon is giving me about Talia, about um, her legal status, about how she only married him to get citizenship. Um, I would certainly listen to any expert testimony. Um, immigration status would not that be that relevant until I find that there's abuse, and then if I find that there's abuse, then I would think that it would be relevant to the remedies that Talia has, the VAWA self-petition she can file, the U visa certifica certification request she can make. Um, as to, I guess this is where we get into the question of our earlier partic participant about how I would respond to discovery requests made about immigration status or pending immigration applications, given our earlier slide about confidentiality of those right. immigration applications, right? Mm -hmm. um, and really, the, the first question always to ask as a judge is, how is this relevant? Is a pending immigration application relevant? And I suppose that the argument would be that it's relevant to um, Talia's credibility in some way. But that goes to really the timing of when Talia found out she had the ability to file an immigration application under the Violence Against Women Act. If she found out she could do this or do this long after she filed for a civil protective order and after she called the police, if she did call the police, um, really it wouldn't be relevant then to her credibility. Um, I would not want to violate the Violence Against Women Act by turning over an entire pending immigration application because that entire application and all the information in there is confidential. The question is whether I would turn over just the fact that she filed for immigration relief under VAWA. Um, but the application itself can only be turned over, as I understand it, Cecilia, but correct me if I'm wrong, if she consents or if there's judicial review that needs to look right. at that application, if there's some benefits, right? Right. Yes, and I think it's different if we're looking at it in the criminal and the civil context. You know, in yeah. terms of, for example, if we're looking at it, there might be Brady obligations if the prosecutor, for example, has a supplement D in their file, right? But um, even if criminal, it may be just a fishing exp expedition. I mean, the judge exactly. has to do a camera hearing and weigh the probative value of what's in that application versus any um, prejudicial effect. If a victim right. is recanting, and we know many victims in criminal court recant, then it would be mm -hmm. just cumulative impeachment that does not need to be turned over. Um, right, and there's, and there's useful DHS guidance to this. For example, even in that, the exceptions to disclosure, even in the other kind of criminal context, say that it should be disclosed in a manner that protects the confidentiality of the information. That's so important. So, Can you say that again? <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. So this is um, some DHS guidance. Um, maybe it's from 2013, and if folks are interested, I can send it out after, that even in the exceptions to disclosure, the disclosures are supposed to be done in a manner that protects the confidentiality of the information. So it says specifically in this guidance that defense attorneys might try to get the whole file, right? But the right. entire file in, is not discoverable in its entirety. So it's not like you can go fishing and get the whole thing. Um, so I think that part in the manner that protects the confidentiality of the information is an important part of the puzzle. And I think that NEWAP has some really good uh, materials on this when we're thinking about it in the civil context and also in the criminal context. And but so, in, and in, the criminal con in the civil context, whether there is an application or not, us judges make credibility findings all the time. And, um, you know, it's something I suppose to throw into the, the mix, just the mere fact a request was made. But I think the timing of that request is extremely important. Right. And so there's um, a case, I think, out of Connecticut called Dimage, um, which talks about um, motions to compel um, in the 
in the civil context for, um, I think this is for a U visa, right? And so I think that they're talking a little bit about um, about those motions to compel in, in those circumstances. And so, and it kind of talks precisely about that, kind of what is the purpose of these protections? What is the purpose of AUSC 1357? And the purpose of them is to kind of make sure that people know that the information they're providing, right, is going to be treated appropriately by the immigration service. And so um, we can also absolutely kind of forward those cases um, with the materials afterwards. Yes. So great. Looking at our next slide then. Mm -hmm. Red flag right. for manipulation. Right. And I think this is just kind of building on what we have talked about, about being alert to the dynamics of power and control in the immigration context. And how in creating these protections, you know, Congress was aware of how systems can be manipulated against survivors, including the immigration. And so the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, if it's evaluating a VAWA self-petition or if it's evaluating a, even a U visa case, is aware of these immigration-related forms of abuse. And so this is part and parcel of that effort to have that coercive control. And so this is just something, for example, if there are cross petitions for protection orders um, or these allegations, because as we're going to talk about toward the end of our presentation, this can have pretty serious consequences. And so I think it's just being mindful in the work that we do for that potential um, that someone might be manipulating the system against the survivors who maintain that coercive control. Great. So going to our next slide, what you can do, I think one of the important things judges can do is take a leadership role in this area. We know from all our National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judge trainings that when a judge calls a meeting, people really do come. And we should call meetings and educate our justice partners about um, court recesses, re resources and improving the processes regarding um, cases of um, immigrant survivors. Um, there are Department of Homeland Security pamphlets on VAWA confidentiality that can be handed out by um, our justice, justice partners in our courtrooms. We can refer litigants to resources to our access to justice centers, to nonprofits and domestic violence advocacy organizations and we need to always be mindful and have and be mindful in our meetings with our justice partners not to allow um, abusers to continue um, to intimidate in our courtrooms. We can train our fellow judges about um, the dynamics of immigrant domestic violence. Um, really look at the best interest of the children, let everyone know that Everyone in the courtroom gets due process, no matter their immigration status. I always love to quote Long Wing versus the United States, which is an 1865 case that says, all persons, no matter what their immigration status, have access to justice to the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment. Um, it's an important case to cite. And it's, it's not about who comes from the better country. It's about everyone starting on an equal, equal playing field and looking at what's in the best interest of the child in our court. And I guess um, it's really always important to remind litigants that, or to remind ourselves that uh, a United States citizen perpetrator of abuse is not necessarily a good parent. But I, what we can do is educate our justice partners. So um, anything you want to add, Cecilia? No, I think that's great. Um, and I was just reading um, um, Julia's uh, uh, experience when she was in court, which sounds pretty horrific. Um, be interesting to know what the reaction was from the bench on that. Um, if you want to write in the chat box. Yes. Egregious. 
Um, so we have about 11 minutes left. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, yeah. Judge Briel, do you want to run us through U visas? And I think there was yeah. a presentation on this previously, so they might already be experts. So we'll just uh, we'll quickly go through U visas. Talia does have several forms of immigration relief, including U visas. These are the certifying agencies that can uh, certify U visa uh, request. Uh, U visa is a visa that can be obtained by a victim of certain qualifying crimes who has been, is currently being, or will be helpful in the detection, investigation, prosecution, conviction, or sentencing of a crime. And judges can sign U visa certification forms. Um, also, Child and Adult Protective Services can sign these forms, and it usually doesn't happen. I think there needs to be a lot better training of our child and adult protective service agencies. But moving to our next slide, these are the qualifying crimes that you're going to see um, for U visas. Let me get to that slide here. Oh, here they are. OK, so there's, um, these are all the qualifying crimes, but there's really a lot more crimes than these. If you're a victim of any of these crimes, as well as other related crimes and attempts to commit these crimes, then you perhaps qualify for a U visa. Um, and you know, if someone threatens to have their intimate partner deported, that's a kind of witness intimidation. And you see that witness tampering is on this list of qualifying crimes. So there's a lot of crimes. And just quickly going to our next slide here. Um, right, and I think um, just one quick point on this one. Um, we see kind of that coming up in a lot in the context of employment-based cases, for example, sexual assault or something else, crimes that occur in the workplace. Um, a lot of where those kind of witness tampering, extortion crimes might be occurring. And yeah. in as much as possible, other than we have kind of a similar crimes, it's just as a practice planner, it's, it's important to, um, as much as possible, try to frame the case in context of one of these enumerated categories. I think it's just easier for the immigration service if they know which box you're picking and it's, you know, it's easily kind of being able to place um, the crime that you're certifying in one of these categories. So that's right. important that's for me. So you, you pick like sexual assault or you pick witness intimidation and then you explain um, how it is or witness mm -hmm. tampering, how it's related to that box. Correct. Is that right? Yeah, so they, okay. they used to have an other box on the certification form, and they don't have it anymore. So they, they really want you to, um, to pick what the qualifying crime is from the enumerated list. OK, great. So um, then you just have to decide whether um, you can certify that there is the detection by you if you're a judge, because you don't investigate or prosecute, or, or there's investigation, prosecution, conviction or sentencing of a qualifying crime. Um, and let me just go to the next one. Um, there's three elements that really need to be, sh uh, that a judge needs to certify, that the applicant was the victim of the qualifying crime, that the applicant had knowledge of the crime, and was, is, or will be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of the crime. So if you have Talia coming with a civil protective order that talks about the abuse, certainly there is the detection of a qualifying crime of domestic violence. And the judge would be able to sign a U visa certification request. Um, you do not have to find as a judge or any of those other agencies substantial emotional or physical harm, um, because that's up to the, the federal judge. And really, it's any credible evidence. So it's an extremely low standard to be able to sign one of these U visa certification requests. So moving on, so we can finish in time. Right. Um, um, so yes, we're going to talk about kind of the consequences of findings or convictions of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, because it can be pretty significant. Um, for example, if we're looking at um, if you're domestic violence, 
including a violation of a protection order, can be a deportable offense. And so I think it's important to think about that in terms of um, how in the event of cross petitions, in the event of all these things, that if there is a protection order in place and it's a violated, that can be considered to be a crime of domestic violence, which should make it a deportable offense. It can also come into play as a matter of discretion uh, for an application for a green card and as an issue for good moral character uh, which is both important in the VAWA context, because part of proving a VAWA self-petition is proving that you are a person of good moral character, and then also for naturalization. And I just want to make an important part of what good moral character can mean in the VAWA context, because I think oftentimes, you know, it's important for us to kind of combat this perfect victim fallacy that might come into play. You know, for example, I once had a client who was arrested for assault because she had scratched the arms of her abuser, and the police came, and she was arrested, and she was assaulted. And so we were able to kind of say this happened, but there's guidance out there that's saying if there is a nexus between the domestic violence, then that is a way that could be potentially used to explain issues that might ordinarily affect good moral character is if you can show that there might be a way that there's a nexus to the abuse. Um, so that is something I think that's important to keep in mind um, if you're coming across this in your cases. Um, you can get my email, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it. And so it can have real consequences in terms of other immigration, um, immigration consequences. And the other thing I think is important to keep in mind um, is that there are also provisions under um, the Adam Walsh Act and for IMBRA, the International Marriage Brokers um, Act that talks a little bit about how criminal information can be compiled and sent to someone for whom you might be applying for a fiancé visa, that that information has to be disclosed because it might be um, you know, possible to find, have that information and that has to be disclosed to immigrating fiancés and spouses. And, or to kind of you know whether or not they might feel safe in the relationship. And also, the Adam Walsh Act um, was in 2000 and passed in 2006. And that is a law that basically amends the Immigration and Nationality Act to prohibit U.S. citizen and legal permanent residents if you've been convicted of a specific offense against a minor from filing family-based immigration petitions on behalf of any beneficiary. Um, unless the Secretary of DHS determines that there's no risk and it has to be in his sole and unreviewable discretion. And so I think this is just something to keep in mind, particularly against crimes against kids. Um, there's certain specified offenses against the minor, um, which include kidnapping, false imprisonment, um, solicitation, um, and other kinds of solicitation to practice prostitution. And, and so there are certain designed to combat those offenses against children, which would be barriers, period, for U.S. citizens applying for any additional family. Um, so that is also what we talked about, violations of protection orders being deportable offense. I and think it's important to note that some of my colleagues are now saying when they issue a civil protective order that a violation could result in your deportation exclusion from admission or denial of naturalization under the laws of the United States because even a technical violation of certain civil protective orders can cause removal even if there's no conviction. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, um, yeah, it, it's different postures of the case when admissibility might apply and when deportability would apply. And so that's why I think it's important for people to connect with knowledgeable immigration practitioners so they can kind of better understand in this particular context what the consequences might be, um, depending on their own um, kind of position in the case. And so also kind of talking about kind of what some, might some other options be um, in terms of pleading or deferred sentencing agreements or holding cases in abeyance. Right, and this is what Judge Brielle just 
just mentioned, you know, talking about how the admission of guilt on behalf of a Kisbani can result in the immigration conviction for immigration purposes, even if there is a deferred sentencing agreement. Because the admission of fact sufficient is considered to be an immigration violation, um, so even if that does eventually go away. Um, here is our website. And so 